This is a production of Cornell University. All right, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the research I've been doing in Michelle Celia's lab over the last year today. Uh, we're using mass spectrometry to study citrus screening disease, and there's a number of projects underway on citrus screening in the Celia lab right now, but this figure here represents the central objective of the project that I'm going to talk about today, where we're trying to peer inside the psyllid and understand the proteins and protein interactions that are essential for transmission of the citrus screening pathogen, the Bifidobacter, by the Asian citrus psyllid, the insect vector of the disease. <clears throat> Sorry, the insect vector of the pathogen. I was told to uh, keep these terms straight for a plant biology audience. <laughs> uh, keep me honest, I am a plant biologist by training. Uh, this is uh, the outline of my talk. Uh, first, I'm going to uh, go through an introduction to the citrus screening pathosystem. Then I'm going to discuss the work that we're doing with quantitative proteomics to understand the proteins involved in the proteins affected by, by the psyllid harboring the citrus screening pathogen. In the third part of my talk, I'm going to review the approach that we're taking to discover protein interactions within the insect vector that may be critical for transmission. So I'm going to introduce the pathosystem. First of all, I just have to say I was just uh, delighted to uh, meet Professor Lorbeer here before uh, the talk, and I understand that he is a California. Oh, uh, is that me? <laughs> uh, that he is a California citrus farmer who is actually uh, helping fund this work, and so um, you know that he he certainly more than any of us knows the threat to this disease to the citrus industry. Um, that we're certainly highly motivated to address this problem because of the uh, the clear and present danger that it poses to the citrus industry in this country. So uh, just to um, just to back up a little bit, citrus screening disease is also known as Huanglong Bing or HLB. Huanglong Bing means yellow shoot disease, and this figure down here on the left shows the yellow foliage that's characteristic of trees that are affected with the pathogen. Uh, the pathogen that the, uh, well, first of all, uh, the disease was first detected in Florida in 2005. Uh, it's now widespread throughout Florida, and it, it just appeared in California in 2012. There's a lot that we don't know about this, disease, but it has been associated with the bacterial pathogen Candidatus liberbacter asiaticus. I say associated because Cox postulates have not been strictly fulfilled, uh, given that we cannot culture this bacteria and, and introduce it into a healthy plant to, um, to make it sick. The, um, the consequences of the disease is uh, a reduction in the quality and quantity of fruit. Uh, you see here on the lower right these immature fruit that don't properly ripen. The, the disease trees are highly susceptible to fruit drop. And the reality for farmers is that they see a reduction in the quantity and quality of their crop for several years before the trees die. Uh, the uh, Asian citrus psyllid pictured right here is a hemipterin insect, a, a piercing sucking insect that feeds on plant phloem sap. Uh, this uh, is in the same group of insects such as the aphids and white flies that are, are well characterized for their ability to transmit plant disease. So to get this work off the ground, we've, we've put a bunch of effort in the last year and a half to established citrus screening research infrastructure at Cornell, and I'm just going to review some of the, the some of the work that we've done in that regard. I, I also do want to acknowledge the funding that we've gotten from the California Citrus Research Board and from the USDA to set up this research. There's been an increasing awareness over the last few years of the need to, to bring in the best possible science to help establish or discover cures or treatments for this disease, and, uh, and, and we're fortunate uh, and grateful for that funding. Uh, so the main center of operations for our citrus and psyllid rearing uh, research is in the virology and nematology lab up at the top of Tower Road. And so here uh, we've got some reaching growth chambers where we grow citrus seedlings. We've also got greenhouses where we can grow uh, mature citrus trees. And then we've got rearing facilities for uh, establishing and maintaining colonies of the Asian citrus psyllid vector. 
And so this is a picture of the containment that we use within these growth chambers, these bug dorms. And we've got separate growth chambers for, for insects that are healthy, that have never been exposed to the pathogen and feed on healthy trees, and another growth chamber where we rear psyllids on infected trees. And, and we monitor the infection status of the insects by, by qPCR to uh, make sure that everything goes according to plan. Um, there are a lot of collaborations that Michelle has developed that has enabled us to do the research that we do. Uh, so I mentioned the facilities that we've set up in Ithaca. I'll just talk about the, um, the support that we've gotten around the country. At uh, USGA ARS in Beltsville, John Hartung's lab has given us advice and support on how to grow citrus in the Northeast. Uh, USGA Fort Pierce is home to some of our, our core collaborators. We've received training and protocols on the psyllid colony maintenance, citrus grafting, and we've received a lot of plant and insect material from them as well. Uh, UC Davis, I'm really not going to talk too much today about the work that is ongoing at UC Davis, but we're part of a multidisciplinary team trying to develop early detection technologies for citrus screening. And, and at UC Davis, they have a, a biosafety level three contained research facility where, where they can keep these infected plants and psyllids uh, very nearby the citrus growing regions. That's one of the benefits that we have in Ithaca. If the psyllids escape, there's no citrus growers for them to colony, but still we keep them under lock and key. Uh, UC Riverside, they have a, a citrus germplasm repository that we get seeds from. And Hacienda Heights, um, I'll, I'll talk about this more in a minute, but this is the, the site in California where the first infected tree was discovered. And, and we've received material from trees in that vicinity as part of an effort to, to track the spread of the disease from that first mm -hmm. infection. So Florida and California, these are the two largest uh, citrus producing states in the country, although Texas uh, produces a decent amount of citrus as well. There's some in Arizona. Um, and I'm just going to review the differences in the situation with the disease in Florida and California, and also some of the differences in the uh, industry in those states. So Florida, uh, the psyllid vector was first found in 1998 and the first disease tree was discovered in 2005. Since that time, the disease has spread all throughout citrus growth in the state. It's, a, it's essentially endemic. There are no regions of the state where the psyllids and where the disease did not exist. This has caused uh, significant economic loss, um, greater than $5 billion, 8,000 plus jobs have fallen by the wayside as uh, these citrus growers have really uh, suffered uh, a severe blow to their livelihood. Uh, the Florida oranges are primarily sold for juice, so um, you know one of the problems that they have is just a major overcapacity with these juice production facilities that they, they can't keep running. Uh, but they're trying to salvage their crop, so I guess I'll just stop and say that the, the diseased fruit, it, while it is of lower quality, they have found that it can be blended with other fruits to salvage their crop, and that's what they're currently doing. And you'll see that in the supermarket with mango, orange juice, and other blends that are currently being made available. That's largely in response to this. California uh, is a completely different situation. Um, the psyllid was first detected in California in 2008, um, although by this time the psyllid has uh, spread over a fairly wide range in Southern California. Um, there was, there's only been one tree that's been confirmed infected uh, by a, a qPCR assay for direct detection of the Librobacter pathogen. Uh, that tree was discovered in 2012, and there have been no reports of diseased trees since that time, but there can be an extended incubation period, um, asymptomatic trees that don't test positive. So um, people are kind of walking on eggshells there. In California, there's less juice production, more the fruit is sold as fresh market, uh, for fresh market consumption, and that gives growers fewer options for salvaging a disease crop. So these organizations, uh, the California uh, Research and Development Foundation, or sorry, the Florida Citrus Research and Development Foundation, the California Citrus Research Board, these are, um, these are agencies that are run by citrus growers out to save their livelihood. And so um, we're funded by them, and we're working hard to uh, give them practical solutions that they can apply. So um, 
this figure just captures the, the critical biological players in this interaction that we're going to discuss in a bit more detail over the course of the talk. So, um, uh, CLAS, uh, Candidatus Labyrobacter asiaticus, is the gram negative bacterial pathogen associated with the disease, as I said. Diaphorina citri is the vector. Citrus is the plant that we're interested in. The other two elements on this slide, first, um, let's just talk about the bacterial symbionts of the Asian citrus psyllid. And this is um, one of the characteristics of hemipterine insects, is they're known to have uh, highly evolved ancient relationships with bacterial endosymbionts. In some cases, these bacterial symbionts serve to uh, provide um, a nutritional supplementation uh, for the nutritionally unbalanced diet of plant foam sap. Uh, in the psyllid, uh, there, there could be a more complex relationship with the symbionts, as I'll go into a little bit later. And another element which is relevant to this pathosystem is the fact that there is a bacteriophage which infects Liberobacter. And this um, does not appear to enter a lytic cycle, either in citrus or in the phage. Um, but certainly in the field of uh, people doing research on this, the, the idea of inducing a lytic cycle in the phage to, to kill the bacteria is one of the control strategies that's being considered. I just wanted to uh, focus a little bit on the pathogen itself. Um, these are phloem-limited fastidious bacteria, um, and this is a cross-section of uh, sub-element cells. And so these M's are mitochondria, and these arrows point to the bacterial cells. This is a, a more close-up version of the, of the cells right there. The genome size is around 1.2 megabases. This is a reduced genome. Uh, Pseudomonasyringi is around 6 megabases. And um, it's an intracellular bacterium. It never needs to penetrate the cell from the outside because it's injected directly into the cell by the psyllids. And in keeping with that, uh, genome analysis shows that uh, this pathogen is lacking the classical type 3 secretion system genes and genes encoding extracellular degradative enzymes. We know a bit about um, how Liberobacter moves within the ACP, not as much as we know about how viruses move within uh, aphids, so that's what this picture is on the right. This is from uh, Stuart Gray showing circular transmission of plant viruses. And I'm just going to grab this back a little bit. And so I just want to focus on, on at, at least in the, in the aphid system, what we know about the barriers to transmission uh, in this circulative transmission pathway. So uh, this is the plant phloem. The pathogen is taken up in the stylet by the, uh, from the plant phloem. It travels into the gut. And here is the, the first barrier to transmission that we typically consider, which is the escape from the gut crossing this membrane into the hemocele, or open circulatory system, of the insect. And in the hemocele, there's components of the cellular immune system, which must be evaded for the pathogen to successfully travel to the surface of the salivary gland. The pathogen needs to enter the salivary gland so it can be injected as a component of saliva into a healthy plant, completing the transmission cycle. The objective of this work, why we want to understand the transmission within the psyllid more, is to identify novel targets in the vector to block CLAS transmission. So I think an obvious question after that is, OK, well, you have those targets. Well, then what do you do? And so I just want to take the opportunity in this slide to discuss some of the technology development that has been done, that's uh, currently still underway, uh, to develop mechanisms for, for transfer of this technology into application in the field. So there has been proof of concept established for two related gene silencing methods. And the first is an RNA interference or RNAi-based approach using a uh, a CTV vector, uh, the citrus tristeza virus, and the, um, this is a transient expression system. Uh, it's a non-transgenic approach. CTV is phloem restricted, so any type of silencing would be occurring in the phloem, uh, which is the ground zero for interaction between the, the insect and the plant and the pathogen. This has been shown to be used to silence plant genes in the phloem, and also to silence insect genes uh, when the insect takes up the, the CTV vector during feeding. 
this technology is being developed primarily uh, by Dr. Uh, William Dawson, uh, also Dr. Gouda at University of Florida, Lake Alfred, and, and these, um, these are among our collaborators in Florida that are uh, excited to work with us when we have good targets for silencing. The other approach is related to this, but this is, um, this is more of an in vitro synthesis of double-stranded RNA, specifically directed at target genes which are desired to be silenced. Uh, this is primarily applied with a root branch delivery system. Um, Dr. Wayne Hunter and uh, Dr. Bob Shatters are the, the drivers behind this technology. Obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of technical hurdles to produce sufficient amounts of double-stranded RNA to drench a lot of roots, but, um, but they're, they're moving this technology along and there's, there's reason to think that um, these, have, um, th th these have potential for, for helping growers in the field. So, uh, some of the work that I'm going to talk about now um, is, is showing how we're using proteomic analysis of the Asian citrus psyllid vector to discover new targets for silencing. Uh, ideal targets in this case would be psyllid specific, single copy genes. Uh, but furthermore, in the second part of the research component of the talk, I'm going to talk about the protein interaction analysis that we're doing. And this is meant to identify protein interactions critical for transmission. Our technology gives us tools to understand the topological shape of these protein interactions, which will really give us a, a more direct route to design specifically tailored inhibitors to disrupt that interaction. Both of these, uh, both of these objectives, uh, the Celia Lab has unique capabilities to, uh, to address them. And I will move into uh, the research component of the talk now. So. Um, Really, the, the, the question that we're first trying to answer here is what happens to the vector while they harbor the pathogen that they're transmitting? We consider this important because if we can understand the molecular levels, details of, this, of this, the transmission within the insect, we can potentially discover an Achilles heel that we could target for suppression of transmission. And I'm just going to uh, take a couple minutes now to just give you just the very basic overview of mass spectrometry proteomics, uh, just to explain why we consider um, proteomics to be a, a, a valuable approach here. Uh, proteins are, are critical molecules to all life forms on Earth. They're involved in, they have structural functions and catalytic functions, and uh, there's been a, an explosion of new hardware and software tools to use proteomics to, to study all the proteins in the sample, or at least all the proteins that can be extracted from biological sample. And the mass spectrometry basically gives us a tool to identify proteins by breaking the proteins down into peptides, uh, which have unique signatures uh, or masses, which can be detected with the mass spectrometer. And this is just a, a, a simple schematic of the mass spectrometer. But really, uh, the, the main take home from this is that there's several questions that we can answer using mass spectrometry. And the first one is, what are the proteins in my sample? Next, we can ask, how abundant are these proteins? Are there differences in the levels of proteins in sample A and sample B? We have the tools to learn about post-translational modifications of proteins. And uh, as you'll see later in the talk, there are strategies to use mass spectrometry proteomics to understand what proteins are interacting in, um, in a given system. OK, so uh, the conditions were fairly simple for this first experiment. I told you that we have these separate colonies of healthy insects and insects that are harboring the citrus green pathogen. And so uh, we did three bio reps of 100 healthy insects and 100 infected insects. This was the, the whole insect samples. And I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail later, but we use a percol gradient method to generate a microbe enriched fraction from a homogenate of infected insects. And, uh, and, and we use that microbe. And, and so this, this has microbial cells, but also the insect cells associated with these microbes. And, and we establish all this with qPCR analysis of these samples. So, so these are the two different sample types that we, that we start with. The next step is to extract the proteins from the samples to digest the proteins into peptides using the trypsin. The mass spectrometer is used to sequence the peptides, and then there are bioinformatics software pipelines that are used to match the peptides 
to the parent protein that they're derived from. We did this work with collaborators at University of Washington, and uh, the bottom line data is that from all this analysis, we identified almost 750,000 peptides, which we mapped to almost 3,850 unique proteins. And essentially, the, the main method that we used to quantify the abundance of these proteins was spectral counting of the peptides that correspond to each protein. How many peptides came from uh, a given protein in sample A versus sample B gives us a, a, an approximation or an estimation of the abundance of this protein in the original sample. So I'm going to go through some of the results from this study. And um, I guess the first uh, set of results I want to uh, just kind of introduce you to by posing one of the questions that we ask a lot. Uh, we know that sea lance is a plant pathogen, but it's less clear whether it is also a pathogen of the insects. And um, hemipteran insects, uh, psyllids, white flies, and aphids, they have an unusual immune repertoire. They lack the classical IMD pathway genes. These are um, possibly involved in gram-negative bacterial response. There's speculation that one of the reasons for this is that it's important for the insects to have a, a permissive immune system, if you will, that will help cultivate relationships with endosymbionts. So um, we, we use this, uh, we, we mined up proteomics data to see if there were relevant data to suggest how the psyllid is responding to the presence of the bacterial pathogen. And we did see some responses that were consistent with a, with perception of CLAS as a pathogen. And I, before I show this data, I just want to say this is counter to some of the findings from Michelle's previous work, where, say, aphids uh, transmitting plant viruses uh, do not show these sorts of antiviral responses. So the, the proteins that I, I really want to draw your attention to first, uh, there are several cuticle proteins. These are involved in mechanical defense. They've been implicated in response to bacteria in a number of different insects. There are several of these that are upregulated in insects that are harboring the, the sea last pathogen. Also, uh, there were uh, iron binding proteins that were upregulated. And this was interesting to us because it's, it's uh, been established in many systems, including systems that some people in this room work on, that, uh, that uh, sequestering iron away from a plant pathogen is a, is a strategy that a plant, or in this case, perhaps a vector, um, an insect vector, may be applying in order to uh, decrease the um, ability of the pathogen to successfully do its pathogenic job. Uh, esterases, uh, these have been primarily associated with increased insecticide resistance. We see a big spike in, in these esterases in infected psyllid vectors. And uh, in addition to the insecticide resistance, so these have also been implicated in response to uh, bacterial pathogens and other insect systems. I just want to take a minute to just um, kind of illustrate the fact that, that not everything is all that cut and dry with this data interpretation. So, uh, there is a, a protein cactus that some of you might be familiar with, which is um, a, very well characterized, particularly in Drosophila, for its role in inhibition of NF-kappa-beta signaling and the toll signaling pathway. And here we have a relatively complex relationship, and I'll just walk you through some of this data. So um, uh, this is the, the spectral counting data. This is averaged over three bioreplicates. And we see here that in the CLAS infected insect, there's a, a big spike in these inhibitors of NF-kappa-beta signaling. And um, so this would be suggesting an immune system suppression in the presence of Librobacter. But we have the opposite scenario in the, in the Percol gradient. Uh, so here we have a big reduction in these inhibitors of NF-kappa-beta signaling when the insects are infected in these microbial fractions with the microbial cells and associated vector cells. So um, we don't really have a, a, a great explanation for that, except that this is a complex situation. The ACP immune response uh, seems, based on the, the whole ACP data, to, to being potentially suppressed by the presence of the pathogen. This could be due to some bacterial effector protein, which is suppressing the insect immune system. But we see the opposite response in the purple fraction. So this is really something that we need to um, do more work to achieve some clarity about. 
okay, I'm going to just delve into some metabolism here, and I'm just going to kind of try to focus everyone's attention on the central molecule here, uh, acetyl-CoA. And uh, basically, the, the bottom line here is that we see a concerted upregulation of citric acid cycle proteins in insects that are infected with the, the green pathogen. And this is really striking in that acetyl-CoA is this point where the flux can either go through acetyl-CoA carboxylase into malonyl-CoA, which is a, a precursor for fatty acid biosynthesis. Alternatively, acetyl-CoA uh, can be the substrate of citrate synthase, and the production of citrate feeds into the citric acid cycle. So it seems on there's kind of a concerted metabolic change in the insect upon infection of a decrease in fatty acid biosynthesis and an increase in the citric acid cycle. And related to that, we do see that there's also enzymes in fatty acid degradation upregulated in, in Levirobacter infected ACP. These include this dehydrogenase, this uh, coenzyme A transferase, and, and this thiolase. So again, at this point, um, we can speculate on what the effect of this is, but at the bottom line, uh, we believe that this supports the hypothesis that there's a metabolic manipulation of the vector by the insect, or of the vector by the pathogen, which the pathogen may be applying to increase the probability of this transmission. Um, but right now, we, we, we simply see these changes in, in primary metabolism. More work is done to establish uh, what the actual effect is and whether it does benefit the pathogen. <coughs> Another metabolic pathway that I'm going to introduce now and come back to a little bit later, and uh, this, is, this involves the, the degradation of valine. Um, so, uh, I didn't know very much about valine catabolism, um, so I'm, um, I don't know if you guys do, if you do, you know more than I did when I started, but essentially, um, valine, one of the core metabolic fates of valine catabolism in insects is the production of uh, propionyl-CoA, which is really a, a central molecule in uh, primary metabolism. And one of the main uh, uh, fates in the insect of propionyl-CoA is juvenile hormone is produced from this molecule. And juvenile hormone is a, is a very important insect hormone. It, it has a number of, of different functions. There's a number of different juvenile hormones. And in the psyllid, there, there's an unusual aspect to this metabolism, which is uncommon in insects. And that is the presence of a propionyl-CoA carboxylase protein. Now, I want to say that I bring this to your attention because this is one of the proteins that we saw uh, we, we knew about this uh, from the genome sequencing, but we see this protein upregulated upon <coughs> infection. And the substrate, or the, the product of this, is this S-methylmalonyl-CoA. And again, we're going to come back to that just a little bit later. Um, but uh, in addition to the upregulation of this propionyl-CoA carboxylase, <coughs> there's a concerted upregulation of valine degradation. So uh, these three other uh, proteins in this pathway are also significantly upregulated in infected insects. But with um, this enzyme, methylmalonate semialdehyde dehydrogenase, again, the situation is not entirely straightforward between the two different samples, the whole insect and the purple gradient sample. So, in the whole insect samples, there's really not a big difference in the protein abundance between the healthy and the infected. But there is a huge increase in this protein in the purple gradient fractions, where there's, there's much more of this enzyme in the, um, in, in the fraction associated with the microbes. Keep this in mind, uh, because we're going to come back to this in a couple slides, because I'm going to just take a, a related segue to, to say that another class of proteins that we were very interested to see um, upregulated in response to liver bacter were proteins of the ACP bacterial symbionts. And I'm just going to introduce you to these symbionts um, and, uh, and tell you a little bit about what we know about what's going on inside the ACP. So uh, first of all, Wolbachia. Um, this is uh, not always clear that it's a symbiont. In some uh, systems, it more resembles a parasite. Uh, I guess the most important thing for you guys to know, as you may already know, it's been used in um, the dengue virus mosquito system in an effort to reduce transmission. This is seen as a potential ACP biocontrol agent. Wolbachia is spread throughout the insect, but these, these next two endosymbionts are restricted in their, um, 
uh, in the presence to the bacterium. This is a schematic of the bacterium here. This is a, a, an interspecies organ inside the aphid, that the special, or inside the psyllid, that's a, a specialized association of insect and microbial cells. And you can see down here, this, this is without staining, just the yellow coloration of the bacterium in an insect, or in a psyllid nymph. And this is the cross-section of the bacterium, stained with fluorescent probes to reveal that in the, on the perimeter, are cells of uh, Carcinella, and in the interior are cells of Croftella. Now, uh, to introduce you first to Carcinella, uh, one of the striking elements of Carcinella is it's how small its genome is. It's one of the smallest um, microbes yet discovered, uh, 0.17 megabase genome. Uh, it's got a highly reduced genome, but it does have uh, a number of complete amino acid biosynthetic pathways leading to speculation that, that Carcinella is, in, is a nutritional symbiont involved with provisioning the psyllid with, with amino acids lacking from its diet. Uh, now, Proftella is a bit different. This is a, a bacterium that was just discovered in 2013. It's a bacterium that's unique to the Asian citrus psyllid, and it's also ubiquitous among all populations of the Asian citrus psyllid yet tested. And um, I guess I, I just want to draw your attention to just a, a slight, um, well, the Proftella, these cells are, are in this syncytial cytoplasm in the middle of the bacterium, and I, and I really just want you to, to, to reinforce just the physical proximity between this white matter, which is the, the cytoplasm of this aphid, sorry, <laughs> I used to study aphids, of this psyllid, they have bacteriums too, of this psyllid cell, um, the, the proximity between Proftella and, and this cytoplasm. So, genome analysis of Proftella led to the prediction that it is a polyketide synthesis specialist. Approximately 15% of its genes appeared to be involved in polyketide biosynthesis. So, uh, Nakabachi and Fukatsu, the group that discovered Proftella, they uh, did HPLC mass spec analysis of methanol extracts from uh, psyllids, and they discovered a novel polyketide present at high abundance in, in the psyllid. And, and uh, polyketides, uh, I'm, I expect many of you are familiar with polyketides, um, but just to give you a bit of introduction, they are found in, in many systems in nature, and, and primarily they're produced by bacterial endosymbionts, either of marine sponges, or in some cases of insects, and there are many antibiotics which are polyketides. Well, uh, Nakabachi and Fukatsu discovered this polyketide and they established uh, that it was a highly bioactive compound using uh, cell viability assays with, with both rat and human cells, although not microbial cells. So, uh, so this was very interesting. We had, we had certainly been aware of this paper and uh, we were keen to see that there was a, a coordinated upregulation of Proftella polyketide, synthesis, polyketide synthase proteins in our Librobacter infected psyllids compared to the healthy controls. So there was really um, you know, an immediate question that came to my mind when I saw this data, which is, are there more polyketides actually in the infected versus the healthy psyllids? Um, that was a prediction based on this proteomic data, uh, but, we, but we wanted to do the analysis of the polyketides to see if we could confirm that hypothesis. And so uh, to do that, we went upstairs to the fourth floor of BTI to Frank Schroeder's lab. Uh, Frank Schroeder is a, a world leader in analysis of secondary metabolites from basically any organism you could throw at him. And so uh, Frank Schroeder and his graduate student Jason Hokey uh, worked with us to quantify, uh, quantitate polyketides in healthy and Librobacter infected ACP. And I know this chromatogram is difficult to see, but just to, just to introduce the data, this is an HPLC chromatogram where a methanol extract of either healthy or infected, and these are two different infected colonies with, with different progenitor insects. Um, uh, the, the methanol extract is, is, is fractionated according to its chemical properties, and there are two peaks here that I want to draw your attention to. The first peak is diaphragm, and we established this using mass spec analysis, and we saw the same, uh, the same paranion at a 4 to 4 mass to charge ratio uh, for that peak. Um, 
But this second polyketide, based on the analysis that the Schroeder lab did, that, or sorry, the second peak, based on the analysis that the Schroeder lab did, this seems to be another uncharacterized polyketide. And this bar graph on the right just shows the uh, distribution, and there's no error bars because the, I'm just presenting the data from this one replicate. We do have a second replicate where we've repeated that. I, I wasn't able to incorporate that into this data. Um, but we do see that between the healthy and the two infected colonies, there is a significant upregulation in both of these polyketides. And in particular, the second infected colony, it seems like you know, these two peaks summed together are approximately the same, but there's a different distribution of the two polyketides. And, 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 and the mass, the, the fragmentation patterns of these compounds really do reveal that they're, they're probably quite similar. We're doing NMR currently to, um, to establish the structures of these compounds, to confirm the structure of diaphragm and establish the structure of the second polyketide. Um, so our next question from there really was, OK, so Croftel is making more polyketides in the infected insects. Now, is that because there's more Croftella in the infected insects, or is there some activation of polyketide synthesis in Croftella that's occurring upon perception of Lubrovactor? And so we use uh, qPCR for um, quantitation of microbial uh, copy number. We use standard curves to, to really, um, uh, on, on a known standard, so we can absolutely quantify uh, the, the pathogen titer. And, uh, what this data shows is that, in fact, the CLAS infected psyllids do have more Proftella endosymbionts. And so the green bars are the uh, Lubrovactor titer. And so, you know, th this I'm not going to go into, but for our purposes, it's really a very compelling piece of data that the, the infection status is so much different between these two colonies. Um, but also, we can see that between the healthy and each of these infected colonies, there, there is an increase in the, the number of Proftella cells that we see. Okay, I'm just going to try to uh, use this slide to pull together what we know about, or what we, what we are hypothesizing right now about metabolic interplay among uh, the, the ACP vector and the uh, CLAS pathogen and Proctella related to polyketide metabolism. So, uh, so we see uh, polyketide biosynthesis is increasing upon infection with Libra vector. S-methylmalonyl-CoA is most likely the polyketide building block that is making the Proctella polyketides. And our proposal is that this upregulation of valine catabolism in infected insects is producing this S-methylmalonyl-CoA as a polyketide building block, which the psyllid is then provisioning to Proctella for the polyketide biosynthesis. So one other point to make, all of these are, are mitochondrial enzymes, and the bacterium is just loaded with mitochondria. And so I, you know, I just really present this as the fact that not only does this model come out of our data, but based on the physical properties of uh, the distribution of the bacteria in the organism, uh, we feel like this is, um, this is somewhat believable. Uh, another component of this, I had mentioned uh, juvenile hormone biosynthesis was uh, where propionyl-CoA uh, typically flux of that goes through. Juvenile hormone um, induces expression of vitelligen, and, and we see uh, several vitelligenin proteins that are down-regulated upon infection. So uh, really, right now, uh, we'd like to, to directly test juvenile hormone levels and see if these are actually uh, modulating in response to infection with the pathogen. Uh, and this enzyme is, uh, when, we, when we think about targets that we'd like to use for silencing, this is one that we're very attracted to. Uh, first of all, it's, it's not in bumblebees, it's not in other insects that you're going to find in a, in a citrus grove, so the bioorthogonal uh, effects on other insects is reduced, and, and it, may be, um, it may play a critical role in disrupting the production of polyketides by Proctella. And, um, you know, we don't know what those polyketides do yet, but that's some of the work that we'd like to do. So uh, some of this data, um, we believe, shows that the infected insects have a metabolic disorder that could be the result of manipulation by the vector. The psyllid may be sensing Libra vector as a pathogen of the insect, not just a plant pathogen. There's drastic metabolism changes in the psyllid upon infection. And uh, infection with Libra vector affects the uh, Proctella symbiont. And 
uh, th there's uh, a model that we're developing of uh, potentially a bacterial tug of war between the symbiont and liver bacter for resources of the ACP. There's more diaphragm produced upon infection with CLAS. We'd like to know why and what that's being used for. Uh, we discovered this, this new polyketide that I showed you and identified enzymes and valine catabolism that are potential targets for uh, knockdown um, to affect some measure of, of ACP control. So um, I'm going to spend a few minutes here uh, as I wrap up my talk talking about another project that is ongoing using uh, tools of our collaborator at University of Washington, Jim Bruce, to, to discover protein interactions in this vector pathogen symbiont pathosystem. Again, I'm just going to revisit the concept of circulative transmission of Libra vector in the ACP vector. The pathogen must circulate through the insect for successful transmission, crossing multiple barriers to transmission. We want to identify novel targets for HLB control, and we have an experimental approach that will allow us to discover protein interactions relevant to transmission of Lubrovactor and model the shape of the interface, giving us the tools to design inhibitors of, of proteins of the pathogen vector or symbiont that are involved in, in uh, transmission of the citrus green pathogen. So um, the, the, real, um, the real tool here, protein interaction reporter technology, as I said, was developed by, by Jim Bruce at University of Washington. These are a couple of the, the critical references that can go uh, into great detail about their technology. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this right now because I don't have time. But the fundamental um, uh, output or objective of this work is to, to map uh, very precisely protein interactions in cells. And uh, basically this figure uh, demonstrates that the crosslinker is penetrating cells and cellular organelles. Uh, the crosslinker has a, a biotin tag on it and that's what the, the staining is for here. These reactive groups react to surface exposed lysines on protein surfaces and they're about 30 angstroms apart. So when we identify proteins that are crosslinked, we have a, a distant constraint that can allow us to do homology modeling of the, the shape of this interface. And uh, there's uh, a number of different outcomes of this cross-linking. When the cross-linker is mixed with uh, your cells of interest, uh, there can be dead-end cross-links, there can be in, in, intramolecular cross-links that give information on the protein three-dimensional structure. We're mostly interested in the intermolecular cross-links that give us uh, physical evidence of protein interactions. So um, we wanted to use, uh, create an, an enriched sample as starting material to in, increase our chances of not just finding psyllid psyllid protein interactions. So uh, I mentioned previously that we used a percol gradient for enrichment. Uh, I just give you a slight more introduction to this right now. We basically homogenize infected psyllids load the psyllids onto this percol gradient, and ultracentrifugation leaves us with these two gradient fractions, which are enriched not just for liver bacter cells, but also for the psyllid endosymbionts and for the associated psyllid cells. Um, and these, we've done uh, backlight live dead stain to show that these are intact and viable microbial cells uh, that can be recovered from the gradient. So, uh, Quite simply, I mean not simply, but practically simply, in doing the experiment, we add the crosslinker to these enriched cells and proceed with the protein interaction analysis workflow. And I'm just going to uh, really almost uh, you know, skim over this just to say that the, there's a sample preparation step I described. The crosslinking reaction happens at room temperature within an hour or two. Proteins are extracted, digested, enriched. Mass spectrometry ultimately gives us a unique signature of the cross-linked peptides. Bioinformatics is then used to identify the proteins that the peptides come from, and 3D homology modeling is used to map the interface of these proteins. And in spite of the enrichment, still the vast majority of the cross-links that we saw were between two psyllid proteins. But we mined our data, and we saw three cross-links that I'm going to briefly share with you today that we're excited about following up with. And the first two relate to cross-links between psyllid proteins and endosymbiont proteins. And these are ribbon diagrams uh, showing the cross-linked proteins with the cross-linked residues indicated in red. And the first cross-link is between myosin of the psyllid, this is a, a molecular motor associated with the cytoskeleton, and anpronylate synthase of carcinella. 
Antronellia synthase is interesting because this is a rate limiting enzyme of tryptophan biosynthesis. The carcinella associated with the ACP has a complete tryptophan biosynthetic pathway. All the other carcinella genomes that are sequenced, I think there's six more, do not. So this really could indicate that there's a specialized interaction between the psyllid and carcinella related to tryptophan biosynthesis, and, and this could be critical for the nutritional symbiosis. The second crosslink that we found was between another myosin protein of the psyllid and an anchorin domain containing protein of Wolbachia. And uh, there's some work, and maybe it was done by you, that characterized the Wolbachia genome as having uh, a large number of, of, of genes encoding proteins with anchorin like repeats. These include potential effector proteins that may be secreted from Wolbachia. And uh, anchoring domains are, are known to mediate protein-protein interactions, and this includes the anchoring domain of myosin phosphatase, and myosin is a, is a well-characterized interaction in the human cells. So uh, at the first level, uh, these data give us uh, the, the tools to understand biochemical processes which underlie interactions between host and symbionts, and they also put us in a position to design inhibitors of these specific interactions which may have an impact on transmission of the pathogen. Uh, just my final uh, uh, data slide here, a um, uh, 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 piece of data that we're really excited about was the discovery of an unambiguous homodimer <coughs> of a Librobacter bacteriophage protein that we uh, found cross-linked in these in the PIR analysis of the enriched purple fraction. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with the uh, lysogenic and the lytic cycle of bacteriophages, so I'm not going to go into this right now except to say, as I said before, the conversion of the phage from a lysogenic to a lytic state may be a viable control strategy. And so first of all, just the fact that we see uh, phage protein uh, produced inside the psyllid is, uh, is news to this field. Um, there, it's, it's not, it has not been believed that um, the phage protein production is occurring inside the psyllid, although we cannot discount the possibility that the phage protein was made in the plant and then the psyllid consumed it. Uh, but really, um, what, what we're really excited about is we have structural details of this homodimer orientation, which may provide insight into the function of this phage protein and give us tools to manipulate uh, the phage to um, uh, to, to provide a tool for um, treatment of uh, Librobacter affected trees or, or vectors that carry the Librobacter pathogen. So to wrap up my talk, um, what, what I've tried to uh, describe to you first of all is that we've discovered proteome changes in insect, um, in insect which harbor the super screening pathogen that reveal changes in the metabolism both of the vector and its endosymbionts. Secondly, uh, with the protein interaction reporter work that I've just shown, we've discovered protein interactions involving pathogen and endosymbiont proteins within the vector, which may be targets for specific ACP control. We've got a lot of ongoing work to follow up this work, and there are other projects that I didn't have time to mention today, but uh, we're really interested in testing this hypothesis of conversion of psyllid valine to Proctella diaphorin. Uh, there's isotopically labeled valine that's available commercially from Sigma uh, that we have uh, feeding studies planned with. Um, we've identified this novel polyketide. We have experiments, or, or the shorter lab is, is currently um, doing NMR to characterize the structure of this. And uh, as I said, um, we are excited about this cross tongue bacteriophage protein, and we have experiments planned to follow this up with functional and structural analysis. So uh, there's a lot of people who have been involved in this work. Um, I guess I just want to start with some of the people whose work I didn't talk about. Uh, the SGN, uh, Solanaceae Genomics Network at DTI, including Lucas Mueller, Susan Strickland, Noe Fernandez, have been tremendously helpful with bioinformatics work that we've done here. And we, we owe them a lot of thanks. But I, I really didn't talk about their work that much today. Uh, uh, all the members of the Sealy Lab, uh, especially Jacqueline Mahoney, uh, she takes care of all the citrus and the insects and does a tremendous job. Jared Moore is a chemistry undergraduate who's doing great work on this project. And um, I'll take any questions and thank you all for your time. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web, at cornell.edu.